let's say we have an expression, some number x raised to the power x to the power x to the power x infinitely exponentiated by itself. And we wanted to see what numbers we could input for x so that it would converge to a singular finite real number. Now, this might seem sort of arbitrary or impossible. For instance, my first thought was that any number between 0 and 1 would simply converge to a singular number. But it turns out that there's more nuance to that, and we'll figure that out right now. So to solve this, first, let's just set this whole x infinitely exponentiated equal to some number, let's call it y. And what we can do, therefore, is we can replace this infinite series, or infinite exponentiation, sorry, of x's simply with y. Because it is the same thing by virtue of the infinite sequence that we have. Because it's done infinitely, we can do this property. This and this are equivalent. Now we have to do some more algebraic manipulation to sort of wrench out the areas of convergence, or the values that we could use to find the areas of convergence. So first, what we can do is take the natural log of both sides. And these steps might seem arbitrary, but you'll see at the end that they were all for a singular purpose. And because of exponent properties, we can take this y outside of the natural log. So it'll just be y multiplied by ln of x equals ln of y. Y. Now, what we want to do is divide by y and multiply by negative 1 on both sides. Again, this might seem sort of arbitrary, but it's all to simplify at the end. So if we divide by y and multiply by negative 1, we'll have negative 1 over y multiplied by ln of y. And now we want to carry this negative 1 into this logarithm. So what we would have is negative ln of x equals 1 over y multiplied by ln of 1 over y. This is because obviously y raised to the negative 1, that just equals 1 over y. Now this next step might seem a little bit arbitrary, but what we're going to do is we're going to do nothing to this negative ln of x. But on the right side, what we're going to do is replace this 1 over y with something that we'll be able to simplify later on to something easier. We're going to change this 1 over y to e to the power of ln of 1 over y. Notice that these values are the exact same thing. In this whole process, we've changed no values at all. These are all just sort of complications that we're adding, but all the values are still the same. This equality will still hold. Now to solve for this situation, we sort of need a, a kind of weird function to help simplify this out. What we can use is called the Lambert W function. So in essence, what the Lambert W function is, is that it solves for this exact property. If we have some number w multiplied by e to the w, and this equals z, what the Lambert W function does is that it has this w equal the Lambert W function of z. So if this w was x and this z was y, we would input the y into the Lambert W function and we could solve for x. This has no solution in like modern algebra other than using this sort of weird function. And it could be numerically approximated with like an infinite series, but we won't like delve into that today, but it can be numerically approximated. And also another property just from sort of finicking around with this definition is another extremely useful definition that the Lambert W of C times E raised to the power of the Lambert W of Z will simply equal Z. And we know that E raised to the Lambert W of 
z will equal z over the Lambert w of z. A lot of z's and a lot of w's. <laughs> but these are all equivalent. And just know that the Lambert w function is defined as the inverse to solve for w right here, lowercase w. This is the definition of the Lambert w function. So that is the reason we're using this function. There's no other way to solve for lowercase w in this case other than using this function. So if you notice, we can simply use that for solving right here in our situation with infinite power tower. This is in the exact form of this first one right up here, w times e to the w equals z. And we can use this definition of the Lambert w function in that using the function, we can get the Lambert w function of inputting negative ln of x that equals ln of 1 over y. Now we're almost there. Now what we want to do is eliminate this natural log on the right side. So what we'd have is e raised to the Lambert w of all of this stuff on the left side, negative ln of x, equals the ln will cancel, so it'll just be 1 over y. And now we can use this property over here, where e to the power of lambda w of z equals z over the lambda w of z. We can just replace that right here. So this would equal, just flipping things around, 1 over y equals negative ln of x over the lambda w of negative ln of x. And just flipping things around so it's simpler, we would just get y equals lambda w of negative ln of x over negative ln of x. And this is pretty much the solution. For any x, we would get the infinite exponentiation of what it converges to for y. But there's a slight problem here. For instance, if we had, for example, um, if we had, for example, like x equals 2, what you would find is that if you plug this into like Wolfram Alpha or some other computational software, you would get that y would approximately be equal to some number that is around 0 0.825. Now notice, in our starting assumption that this equality was true, if we had 2 inputted for x, it's extremely obvious that this would just diverge straight to infinity extremely quickly. But in our solution here, we get a convergent value. So it's obvious that our bounds of convergence aren't the same for this function right here we have for y and for our original, our original statement. So we sort of need to find the bounds ourselves. We can do this by knowing a really important sort of criteria for the convergence. It's that the derivative with respect to y of x to the y must be less than 1 the absolute value must be less than 1. This is true since this means that the function will be always decreasing. And if it's decreasing, then it will arrive at a definitive convergent value. And this will be um, stated in a paper in the description as well. So solving for this, what we can do is sort of find the derivative first. So just sort of doing the work ourselves, we'll get x to the y ln of x, which is simply the derivative of x to the y. And we know that x to the y is simply just x. So we know that, or y, sorry. We know that that is just y ln of x. 
and from logarithm properties, we can move this inside the logarithm. And we know that x to the y is simply just y from our starting algebra. And now we can plug this back into our starting criteria in that 1, negative 1, must be less than ln of y, and that must be less than 1. This is our derivative right here, just reminding. So now finally, <laughs> we have a solution of e to the negative 1 less than y less than e. And e to the negative 1, that's just e raised 1 over e, sorry, y. And here it is. So here's our solution for y. And we can know x by knowing that x will simply equal y to the power of 1 over y. Based on our original statement that x to the y will equal y just solving for x in this instance. Now, we can do a similar manner array right here in that we can state that e raised to the negative e will be less than x and will be less than e to the power of 1 over e. And this is pretty much our solution. So for this y, the lower bound is about 0 0.36, 0 0.3679, and e is just 2.718. And for our lower bound of x, that is just about 0 0.0660, and our upper bound is about 1.445. So what's interesting about this solution is that this x range is not what I thought. It's greater than 1 by about a half. This top range is about 1.445. So that is sort of unintuitive, I think, because, you know, you would assume that anything above 1 would just increase, you know. You go over in sort of like exponential functions that if your base, like, growth rate is above 1, then you, like, always have an increasing function, right? Always exponential growth if it's greater than 1. But in this instance, when we have sort of like pseudo exponential growth right here, but sort of done to infinity, it's not that case, but instead, it's sort of like a weird subset of that case with an answer involving E. I just think that's really cool. And if you guys want another sort of cool thing, this is the convergence in the complex plane. I think the blue is the convergent values and the yellow is the divergent values. So, and this is the real axis and all the others are imaginary values. So it can be known that this sort of infinite exponentiation can be expounded in the complex plane as well.